Hope you have enjoyed the Wilkerson College Symposium today. Our final speaker is Michael Register. He is the newest member of the Grand Line of North Carolina, an esteemed speaker, and his presentation is on Bonson, further continuation of our ritual. Hope you've enjoyed today's festivities. Again, please uh, visit the YouTube uh, page of the Grand Lodge to view these presentations in the future. Without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Pretty good. So it's good to be with you this afternoon. My name is Michael Register, and I believe you introduced me earlier, and I'm going to speak to you this afternoon about North Carolina's monitor and the individual who wrote it, Charles F. Bonson. I would like to thank the officers and the master of Wilkerson College Lodge for inviting me to speak at the symposium today. It's definitely an honor to be here with you this afternoon to be able to share this information. And I do have the honor of batting cleanup, so that can be good or it can be bad. I'll let you tell me that after we get done here. So we'll get this PowerPoint up and we'll get moving. So we're gonna talk about the, the Bonson Manual. And here we have a picture of an original Bonson Manual from 1892 and underneath that is the manuscript and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We see at the annual communication of the Grand Lodge in January the 10th, 1893, that our Grand Master at that time, Hezekiah A. Gudger, approved Assistant Grand Lecturer Charles F. Bonson who prepared a manual adapted to the work of the Grand Jurisdiction. The Grand Master endorsed the manual as it was submitted to him and the Grand Lodge and recommended that it be used by the Brethren. And as we all know, this manual is still being used today. The majority of the Bonson Manual was obtained by Bonson from a book assembled and written by Thomas Smith Webb in 1797 the Freemasons Monitor or Illustration of Freemasonry in the United States. Now Webb took his work from the works of William Preston of England years earlier and Preston's book was the Illustrations of Masonry which was published in 1772. Now as did Webb with Preston, Bonson modified, rearranged Webb's work to suit our jurisdiction's needs. We're indebted to him not only for what he provided to us, but also for what he did not include in our monitorial ritual. We see in a comparison of the Bonson Manual to the Freemasons Monitor that there are a number of things that were edited out of it. For instance, when we look over it as an example in the Fellow Crafts degree, we know that in that degree we talk about the seven liberal arts and sciences and the five different forms of architecture and the five senses of, of human nature. In our rituals and our lectures as we talk now, we talk briefly on some of those, but in Preston's and Webb's work, they were expounded on greatly. We see here we have feeling, smelling, and tasting as the senses, and each one of those has a small paragraph that goes along with that. So Bonson saw that in a need of time, probably, that we needed to pare that down so uh, it would not take us as long. It is said that Preston's lectures, when he was giving them, would sometimes take a full day to give the third degree lecture. So we have enough issues now trying to keep brothers in the lodge for a lecture and not leave the lodge room. So we would rather that we uh, do not have to have that issue today. Looking forward, if we take a look at the Masonic books of the time, because we want to think about what was available to Bonson when he was compiling the monitor and putting that together. And we know that our grand historian spoke about earlier, there are a great number of books that he went into that were available during the history and before Bonson started compiling the monitor in the 1890s. There we see there was a Masonic textbook, History of Maestry and Masonic Grand Lodges, Amon Razan for the Grand Lodge of Virginia, which was written by John Dove, the Grand Secretary, second edition in 1854. The Amon and Masonic Ritual of North Carolina, which was published in New Bern, North Carolina in 1805 by the order of our Grand Lodge. The True Masonic Charter Hieroglyphic Monitor by Jeremy Cross, which was published in 1819. And then another interesting book is The History of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky in Relations to the Symbolic Degrees by Rob Morris, Grand Master, which was published in 1859. As we look and compare and look at each one of those books, we can see where he might have taken things from each one of those books and put into the monitor. But as we heard earlier, a number of books were and they had changes and things taken from Webb's work that were 
absolutely just copied from one book to the next. So where does it come first, the chicken or the egg, to try to track it down and see exactly where it comes from? One thing that we do want to look at, and one thing that I found in my research while I was uh, at Farmington Lodge, was I found a copy of Amon Razan, and it was for the Grand Lodge of South Carolina. This was located at Farmington Lodge. It was written by Fr Brother Frederick Dalco, MD, and it was published in 1807 in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, the interesting thing on this book is if we look, we see that there's an inscription, and it reads that this book was found on Friday, the 7th of February, 1828, on the road between Captain Saunders and Tatum's store by Walter B. Johnson. So this is all in the area of Farmington Lodge, and then at some point in time, that book made it to Farmington Lodge. So could this have been a book that Bonson pulled from for information when he was building the monitor? We don't know, but I think it's fascinating that they have a copy of that in their lodge. Now, I had the opportunity uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago, to actually go to the Grand Lodge and examine the manuscript of the monitor. And when did, when did we get it? You would think we might have always had the monitor, but it did not work out that way. We see here that from some letters that are contained in the Grand Lodge archives from the Grand Secretary of the time, and a letter from uh, Brother Newcomb at that time that they had met with Bonson at Bonson's grandson, Charles F. Bonson Jr. And they had met him at a district meeting and he had shown them the actual copy of the manuscript. So there was some correspondence that went back and forth until 1959, the, the manuscript was placed in the Grand Lodge archives in, in Raleigh. And it's available for your inspection today if you'd like to go look at that. So when we look at the manuscript itself, we see here on the left, we have a title page and then we have the contents on the other page. These read just about verbatim to what it is in our monitor that we have now. You notice that on the bottom of the title page, it says Statesville, North Carolina, yet on the contents page, it says in Farmington. So it would lead us to believe that the book was not put together all in one place and it was done in different parts, maybe with different individuals. Now, as we go through the book, we can look in the first degree, and there's some interesting strikeouts that we see in the manuscript. We see here a, a part that says, Freemasonry, a beautiful system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. And we get a little bit further down, and then we see that it says, the ethics of pure religion. But what you don't see really good is if you look down below here, we see that the word Christianity was marked out. So we see that here in the first degree. And then when we go to the funeral service, we notice that in the funeral service, they have added where the goodness of our creator knows no bounds. But then we look under this and the, the strikeout talks about Christianity again and it having reference to our savior. So why was that done? We can't read their minds, we don't know, but we would like to think that masonry being not of any one religion and accepts men of any religion who have a belief in deity, that they might have thought this was they were creating it and said, we really need to create this book so it does not specifically say you need to be a Christian to be a mason. Now, on the sidelines of the manuscript, I have turned this where you can actually read it, but th it, this was on the actual side of the manuscript. We see an asterisk to where this was added into the funeral service. And it talks about the funeral grand honors and how they're supposed to be done. So to them, I guess it was an afterthought. They forgot to put that in there. They thought Masons being as they were needed instructions on how to do things. And we need to tell them exactly how that needed to be done. As we look at a copy of an 1892 Bonson on the contents page, we see some interesting things we don't have in our Bonson manual today. We see that there's a petition for degrees, a petition for membership, and a certificate for, wid for widows and orphans. Here's how the pages appear. The one thing that was interesting was a certificate for widows or orphans. And we see how this reads out that it names the person and it names what lodge that the, person, uh, the person's relative was from, whether they be a widow or an orphan of a member that had passed away. 
So we feel like this is probably put there for, for the purpose of if this widow or orphan needed relief, this would be something that they could present to a lodge or another mason to obtain that relief. Now, when we look at the Bonson Manual, a lot of times we think about that the only things that are in the Bonson itself are just lecture things that we do in lectures and prayers and charges and things like that. But when we really get into the Bonson and we actually read it, we can see that there's an abundance of light in it that talks about the degrees and certain parts of the degrees and how they were conducted. We see here in the Inner to Prentice in the second section that it's written, it talks about in the ancient mysteries how the, the aspirant himself was blindfolded and kept in darkness for a period of time. This do we, we do not see in any of our other ritual work, but it appears here in the Bonson as an effort to educate our candidate as to why he is going to the, the, the different ceremonies that he's going through. Now, if we look at the first board meeting after the death of Bonson, which was held in June of 1911, we see that assistant grand lecturer, J.W. Rowell, whose picture appears here, brought to the Board of Custodians a manuscript for a new manual. And he requested of the board as a preparatory step that he wanted to present it at a later date to the Grand Lodge for approval and securing its consent to publish. Now, this is an interesting individual. J.W. Rowell is a Baptist pastor from Monroe, North Carolina, and was a member of Monroe Lodge. And at the time he presented his book, he was an assistant grand lecturer. A little backstory on this, we're gonna tell you that when he presented it, the board considered it and the board ruled unanimous, unanimously not to approve it. So why did that happen? In my research, when I went to Farmington Lodge and looked through their older minutes, we find that a gentleman by the name of Leon Cash was a member and a past master at Farmington Lodge. Leon Cash was also a grandmaster in 1925 and he was also the longest serving secretary of our Board of Custodians. Now, when you look at the minutes of Farmington Lodge, we see that Charles F. Bonson serves in the first degree as an officer when Leon Cash is uh, made an entered apprentice. We see that when he is passed to his fellow crafts degree that Charles F. Bonson serves as the senior deacon. We also see in the minutes that when he is raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason, that Charles F. Bonson sits as the master of the lodge during the degree. Later the following year, we see that Charles F. Bonson installs Leon Cash as master of Farmington Lodge. So I think J.W. Rowell had an uphill battle when he was gonna to try to get Bonson's manual taken away by the fact that Leon Cash was the secretary of the Board of Custodians at the time that he presented it. Now, who was Charles F. Bonson? This is his picture as it appears in the front of our current Bonson manual. And you notice that he goes by Chas. You see that a lot if you look up his name and try to find out information on him. Bonson was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in, on February 15th, 1840. And he was one of 11 children. His father, George F. Bonson was born a Moravian in the town of Christianfield, Denmark. And in 1829, he came to Nazareth, Pennsylvania as a teacher. In 1834, he was ordained a deacon and moved to Bethania, North Carolina to take a position of pastor, which is in the Winston-Salem area of our state. And we read that his first wife died in 1837 of consumption, which was the word for tuberculosis at the time. They were married for three years. His second wife, Paulina, whom he met while he was at Bethania, she died in 1858 during childbirth. She, they had, she had 11 children. This was Charles's uh, mother. Now, when Charles was a lad of nine years in 1849, they moved back to Salem, North Carolina, where his father was the pastor over the Salem Church in Salem. He was raised as a pacifist in the Moravian church and he trained as a jeweler in Salem under a gentleman by the name of Elias Vogler. He practiced his trade in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for quite some time after he left Salem to go to Pennsylvania with his father and his new wife. 
And then late in August of 1861, after North Carolina's succession from the Union, Bonson made his way back through the lines and returned to his boyhood home in Salem. He signed up, even though he was a, a devout pacifist, with the Confederate Army to represent the South and the Confederacy. He did not hide his religion and he found a way to serve. We see a portrait of him on the right here, of him in his Confederate uniform, which is hanging in Farmington Lodge. He was a member of the 2nd NC Battalion. He traveled with the Army of Northern Virginia from 1862 to 1864. And he was captured on Roanoke Island and was a prisoner of war for a period of time until he was released in Elizabeth City in 1862. And as many of the soldiers did that were captured and released at that time, he returned back to the Confederate service. During his service, he gained the rank of captain. And in 1864, he was transferred to the 3rd Regiment of the NC Artillery. He served out the rest of the war stationed at Forts Guarding the Cape Fear River and Wilmington, North Carolina. And during his tenure, he served as an assistant quartermaster. While serving, he wrote letters home to his father. And these letters were compiled, compiled in a book by Sarah Bonson Chapman, his great-great-granddaughter. The title of the book, Bright and Gloomy Days, a Civil War Correspondence of Captain Charles Frederick Bonson, a Moravian Confederate, is the book that she wrote and is available on Amazon if you'd like to read it. It's a very interesting book. There's a lot of information about the Bonson family there. Uh, the letters that he writes back are interesting to see the mindset at the time and the, the history and things that were going on. So it's a very fascinating read if you're interested in that period of history to look at. So Bonson comes back to North Carolina and he marries Jane Amanda Johnson on December the 6th, 1865. Jane was the daughter of landowner George Wesley Johnson and his wife, Martha Williams Taylor. And both of these families were longtime residents of Farmington, North Carolina and Davie County, Davie County. Now, Johnson's family, George Wesley Johnson and his family actually founded the Farmington community. So they were staples of the community, huge landowners at the time. So they were very wealthy. So he, Bonson himself kind of married into wealth is what he did. Now, both of these families owned extensive plantations in the area. And at, at Jane was a graduate of the Greensboro Female Academy, which is now called Greensboro College. They had three children, George William, Martha Johnson, Johnson and Francis Henry. The couple lived in Farmington for all of their days on land that was given to them by George Johnson. And before they moved to Farmington in the house you see here, which is still there today, they lived on land which is now called Tanglewood Park outside of Clemens, North Carolina, before they moved to Farmington itself. Bonson farmed the land, he purchased apples and uh, for orchards and grapevines and different things like this. And how do we know that? When they were going through his letters, they found different receipts and things for items that you would need for apple vineyards and or grape vineyards and apple trees and things like this. So there was a number of different paper documents they came across to, to find this. One of the interesting things about Bonson is he worked as a jeweler and he ran a shop on his own property at the house we see here. One of the things in my research as I was going through and looking and, and finding things on him, so I came across this advertisement and I found out that Bonson actually practiced as an optician and he produced his own eye wash called Bonson's Eye Wash. And as you can see from the picture that we have here, you see his picture in the pupil and it says, keep Chasset F. Bonson optician in your eye. Examinations free in Farmington, North Carolina. So another note about that is we found the newspaper article that's, that shows that a Senate bill was proposed, Senate Bill 1124, to allow Charles F. Bonson, an ex-Confederate soldier, to be an, an itinerant optician without a license. And this was in March 10th, 1903, and it was in the Farmer and Mechanic newspaper. So obviously Bonson had some connections or knew somebody somewhere in order to make that happen. Now, Bonson's Masonic career, where does that start at? He starts at Moxville Lodge, number 134 in 1866. 
and then he later affiliates as a charter member of Farmington Lodge number 265 when it was established in 1867. The reason when you start looking at the minutes and the background of Farmington Lodge, you see a lot of the members from Moxville Lodge came over into Farmington because they lived in Farmington and built their own lodge there. And we see at the time period when these lodges are built like this, that the lodges themselves become the center of the community and they become more than the Masonic Lodge, they become the gathering point for the community and for the citizens to use either as halls to have meetings or dances or dinners or different things like this. And when you actually look in our Grand Lodge archives and proceedings, you see that the Masonic Lodges of the day were actually used as enforcement tools for issues or settling issues with people in their communities where they were established at. Bonson served as his Lodge's secretary for a number of years beginning in 1868 to 1888, off and on over a 20 year period. And he also was the master of Farmington Lodge in 19, or 1888, 1889, and 1890. We see his signature to the left over here, where he signs in 1892 as a past master. And the card up top is the card that is in our uh, card file at the Grand Lodge in Raleigh. Now, we know that, that he became a grand lecturer in 1909. Here's the certificate, which is actually the original certificate, which hangs on the wall at the lodge. And we found out that he was instructed in the work by grand lecturer Eugene Grissom in 1890. Now we heard our grand historian talk about earlier how the lecture and the lectures and the ritual work were passed down from one lecture to the next. As with Stevenson, was passed down from Cushman and so forth and so on to where it came down to. And they actually passed the work in, in that, that situation. So Grissom is another interesting character, which we won't get into at the moment, but there's another very good presentation on him that talks about his stint in masonry and the background story for him. He was a member of Hiram Lodge number 40 in Raleigh and was the superintendent of Dorothea Dix Hospital in Raleigh for a quite a period of time until he left the state. He was also a grand lecturer, and when he left being grand lecturer, Charles Bonson was appointed as the grand lecturer. Before his appointment as grand lecturer though, Charles Bonson served for a number of years as an assistant grand lecturer. He was appointed a grand lecturer in 1908 by Grand Master uh, Samuel M. Gaddis, and he served in that position until his death. He served for a number of years on the Grand Lodge Committee on Charters and Dispensations. You see his name coming up very frequently in our Grand Lodge proceedings. One of the things if we think about with the lecturers of the time, as with Charles Bonson, is now as a certified lecturer, when we travel to different lodges, we don't see that that is a big deal for us because we have vehicles to drive, we have uh, modes to, of co conveyances to get there, so it's not a big deal to go drive an hour to go give a lecture or to help another lodge out. But if we think back at the time when Charles Bonson was a lecturer, there were no vehicles going on. People were not driving in the 1890s. They had horses and carriages and road trains and different things like this. So Bonson put a great deal of his time in the, into lecturing the whole state. How do we know some of these things? Well, they were very proud of it when he came to their town. We see here in a newspaper from the Lenore Topic, Wednesday, 7th, September the 7th, 1892, that Mr. Charles F. Bonson of Davie, a Masonic lecturer, went up to Blowing Rock last Saturday, Saturday to deliver a series of lectures to the Masonic Lodge there on the secret work of the fraternity. Now, we also know that we look and we see here in the dispatch, which is on Wednesday, February the 12th, 1902, that Mason's meeting Masons meet Friday night in a special communication at 7.30 o'clock. Mr. Charles F. Bonson, Assistant Grand Lecturer of the Masonic Grand Lodge of North Carolina will be present and will remain with Lexington Lodge number 478 for a week. So he actually stayed for a week. And you see this a lot in different proceedings, uh, different uh, paper clippings where he went and traveled across the state and stayed at many lodges for weeks at a time to teach them the work. 
What else did uh, Bonson do in his career? He was a Royal Arch Mason. He received his Royal Arch degree in Davy Chapter. And when the Davy Chapter ceased to work, he joined Winston Chapter number 24, previously known as the Germington Chapter number 24 until 1876. Now, when I was doing my research at Farmington Lodge, we came across a return to the Grand Royal Arch Chapter that was dated April of 1894, and it was from Farmington Royal Arts Chapter 47. And we see on the right-hand side that at that time, C.F. Bonson was serving in the position of king. Was Bonson a member of the Eastern Star? We look on this headstone where him and his wife are buried, we see that there is an Eastern Star symbol. Not sure if it's not a passworthy matron symbol, but we do know that his wife, Sarah, excuse me, Jane, was a member of the Eastern Star from the time that it was in, uh, chartered in Farmington until the time that she passed away. So I can tell you as a member of the Eastern Star, if your wife is a member of the Eastern Star, you are probably a member of the Eastern Star with her as I am. Now, another neat fact, Charles Bonson is the great grandfather of our most worshipful, or Lester P. Martin Jr., who's one of our past grandmasters and was grandmaster in 1991. I had the opportunity to meet with him uh, before he passed away this past year and spend some time with him and talk about the Bonson family. He actually presented me a copy of uh, the Bonson book, Sarah Bonson's book, that talks about, or Sarah Chapman's book, which talks about the Bonson family and the Confederate letters. Bonson is buried in the cemetery, which is directly behind the lodge. He, he died in 1911. He suffered a stroke while he was visiting Fair Oaks in Johnson County and see on Masonic business. And the Masonic business that he was on was kind of like our lecturing services we do now, schools of instruction. He would travel to Johnson County. There were a number of lodges that were there. There were some other individuals that were with him and he was conducting the school of instruction when he had his stroke. He was transported back to Davie County by train where he passed away on February the 16th, 1911 at the age of 71. And we know that he's buried in the family plot in Farmington wearing his Confederate uniform with his iron cross on his chest. It was stated by past Grand Master Martin that his head was tilted slightly facing to the south. We don't know if that's true or if that's not true. So, but one of the things that when we look at this, he has a number, number of symbols that were, he felt were important to him on his tombstone. And we see here there's an arch above on the top and on the back we have the Eastern Star uh, emblem and we also have the square encompasses on the back of this. Now, after Bonson's death, we see that uh, Most Worshipful Richard Hackett, who was the Grand Master in 1911, says some really good things about him. He says his work took him to every nook and corner of the state and perhaps no Mason was ever more widely known and generally loved by the craft in all the walks of life than to this distinguished brother who by his rare culture, culture, genial manners, gentlemanly demeanor, and rectitude of life commanded the love and respect of all classes. The whole state has been bettered by the life and services of Charles F. Bonson. When we look in the 1912 Grand Lodge proceedings, we see that there is a eulogy for him. It's actually three pages long. And normally you see the eulogies and the Grand Lodge proceedings are reserved for when past Grand Masters pass and, and individuals like this. So for him to have this, it is uh, very obvious that he was extremely influential in his time that he served in the Masonic fraternity. Now, as I told you, I've had the opportunity to go to Farmington, uh, go through some of their records. I made this presentation at Farmington Lodge to some of their brothers uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, that's been something I've been researching for quite some time. And while we were there, we were looking for minutes and we couldn't find them. And I went back and we actually found their original minute books. And what I have here on this slide, we see here, this is a handwritten report and this is of the, the bylaws committee from their lodge when they were forming the lodge. And we see that uh, Monson signs on the bottom as one of the members of their bylaws committee. 
And when we look here at their first set of minutes in April 1867, we see that Bonson served as a senior deacon pro tem for their first meeting that they have there. Also, when you look at these uh, minutes from their lodge, you see that as with other lodges of the time, the people who were members of the lodge, who were the leaders in the lodge, were the folks who were the movers and shakers in their communities. They were the, the leaders in their communities. And it's something that uh, we see a lot in the, in the earlier lodges in our state. Now, one, a couple of the other books that I found when I was there and looking through stuff, we see a copy of the Masonic Code of North Carolina from 1875. And one of the fascinating things about that book is when you look in the front of it, it has an abbreviated history of masonry up to that point. They felt that was important to put in there. And there's also things in that like the opening prayers, the closing charge, things along these lines that they, they felt like were important that they needed because up until we see Bonson's uh, manual that comes out, the North Carolina uh, Monitor, there is nothing other than the other books we heard the Grand Historian talk about that is there for the Masons to use. So when we look at Bonson's Monitor, we see that when it was created, the size of it is the size that you, you can put it in your pocket. So it's like a pocketbook that you can have with you if you're at a meeting and you need to conduct business and somebody needs a reference or we're trying to teach it. And he probably saw traveling as a grand lecturer and assistant grand lecturer that he needed some reference materials for him to go by and also something that he could leave with a lodge when he left to say, here's, here's what we talked about. Here's, you know, here's what you can use. So we see the code here. That is uh, all I have for you, other than to say it's been a pleasure to be here today. Uh, please, one thing I will tell you, and our grand historian talked about it earlier, please, please take care of the history and the papers and the books and the things in your lodge because they mean something. They're important. They're important as to the time that those books were written and the papers that were written. They give researchers folks like myself, our grand historian, and, and a number of other brothers that I know that do a lot of Masonic research, not just in North Carolina, but all across our country and our, our world, they give them the opportunity to go back and to see where we came from. And the one thing about that is it helps us, it helps us not repeat the mistakes of the past so that we may be better in the future because that's what we're all about, guys. We're all about becoming better men and better masons. So thank you very much. I am Danny, master of Wilkerson College Lodge this year. I'd like to thank all the speakers that have participated in today's symposium. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Grandmaster Bradshaw. Thank you for your program. It was very enlightening. Uh, and to all the speakers, um, it's been a wonderful day of education um, and it should last a lifetime with um, the way we preserved it. Um, thanks again to uh, Michael Paul. Uh, appreciate you taking time to do your program for us. Um, Thanks. This concludes 2020's Wilkerson College Lodge 760's Masonic Symposium. Thank you.